like I guess with this one, but uh, I feel I feel very weird talking to so many not cute people, but uh, yeah, it's very early morning, so I will keep the mic on. I guess it's probably better for many of you. Uh, my name is Sandra Corsetti. Uh, thank you for joining us so early for this session. Uh, I'm sorry for those who sit behind me, but that's just the, the, how, how it is, I guess. Uh, I'm uh, the director of the Youth and Media Project at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, which is a research center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so in the United States. Uh, it's officially part of Harvard University. Uh, I'm joined by many, many colleagues, so I did not plan this session on my own. Uh, I will introduce them in a second, and I think because we are not so, so many, we can also do quickly then a, a round of introduction. But I wanted to take at least a few minutes to, because at least for me, again, as I said, it's very, very early, to kind of more on an observational level share with you some thoughts that uh, we had when planning this session uh, to get us more into this mood of what I want to talk about this evening about. So if that sounds good to you, I will start with that and then we'll do brief introductions by everyone.
censored by their governments. And finally, I just want to say something about the persistent gender gap uh, we all know still prevails. And um, it has a, uh, this gap can have profound impact on young women and girls and their uh, participation in digital economy. Uh, that uh, currently about 12% men are more online than women. Or let me put it the other way. Um, the global proportion of girls using the internet is 12% lower than that of men. But also girls and young women are less represented in economy in general. So while uh, labor participation for young men is about 53% uh, of those between 15 to 24, it's only about 37 for women. And these uh, disparities uh, actually mask, uh, th these figures mask disparities in countries where actually uh, we can see that a higher proportion of girls and women have a uh, possibility to participate in labor economy in those countries where uh, women's and girls' rights are not at equal part to those of boys and men. Uh, so in order to, to, to uh, foster and support the girls' participation in digital economy, we need to uh, be able to provide better access for girls, but also to take into account of uh, different social and cultural and gender norms that restrict this participation. So uh, sometimes these training programs for girls, for example, should be uh, uh, bringing the education to them if uh, the girls have a restriction of movement in those countries where they can't move freely uh, as boys. Uh, we also need to provide training to girls that help them learn business and ICT skills. Uh, there are programs that we wrote about in Uganda and in Kenya that are helping young girls uh, uh, develop entrepreneurship skills through uh, training that we offer. But um, also uh, we need to take into account the specific needs of young women uh, very often uh, if we pro provide remote learning and uh, remote digital economy opportunities, we can also support women who are staying at home and working from home, young mothers, for example, which uh, is more difficult to do when uh, they need to leave the home. 
And, and finally, uh, when we talk about skills for young people and particularly for girls, it is important to bring in the private sector. I'm glad that we have representatives of the private sector and companies here because uh, it's e equally important to match the development of skills of young people and adolescents with the labor opportunities and the job market. And I'm talking both of the formal and informal sector. So uh, private sector has a very important role to play to support the development of these skills. And we hope to uh, stay engaged with all of you in this conversation to see how we can jointly do more to enable a greater proportion of young people to benefit from digital economy. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmina. I think we're going to do the, the five interventions all one after the other and then open for conversation. So with this, Andres, please, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you for organizing this session. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I, I would like to talk uh, now a little bit about like these uh, activities that you is uh, developing online, particularly uh, in emphasis and attention to the kind of uh, activities that create some sort of capital. And this is a, a framework that we borrow from the digital inequality researchers, especially the ones who have been looking at how uh, the benefits and tangible, tangible uh, outcomes of using the internet or participating online are not distributed equally. So there are a lot of differential outcomes. Uh, these uh, inequality researchers have been especially talking about like uh, the difference in looking for, for instance, recreational activities online or activities that are uh, more um, leading to finding jobs or like uh, debating public, public issues or uh, seeking financial information. However, we, we discover uh, at looking at the activities that youth are doing online that it's not only this kind of, uh, kind of financial capital oriented activities that youth are doing, but they are also earning other kind of capital such, such as social capital and cultural capital. So even what adults sometimes uh, categor categorize as uh, kind of recreational activities, for instance, using Instagram, sharing pictures of your favorite food or like uh, developing uh, games in an online world uh, that are framed as recreational, sometimes they are leading, uh, they lead to certain kind of capitals that are intangible. So this is very important because at some point, for instance, as uh, with the examples that Sandra was showing at the beginning, such as the video bloggers or the fashion bloggers, or even like the um, YouTubers, uh, video game commentators, as they build uh, personal brands online, develop bi big audiences, they are able to translate their social capital, let's say their network of followers, uh, and as well their cultural capital, for instance, their reputation as skillful uh, video game players or as uh, stylish, uh, uh, fashion bloggers, they are able to translate those opportunities into economic uh, outcomes. Uh, for instance, they establish collaborations with, with brands. They can also do what is called advertorials, that is like uh, doing videos uh, about a particular project or taking pictures of a restaurant in a collaboration uh, with specific companies who actually are providing some remuneration. Um, so this is what we have been discovering and, and there are like a a lot of challenges uh, on this approach, but uh, we, we think it's important to raise those issues. One of the major challenges is like, how can you measure uh, capital that is uh, kind of intangible, right? Like social capital or cultural capital, particularly for youth who is not becoming the state, is not uh, uh, still achieving the status of social influencers, because uh, nowadays we live in a world where, where a lot of uh, youth social influencers get a lot of visibility but they, they are very few. It's very difficult to become a YouTuber with a global audience, or it's very difficult to become a, an Instagrammer who can actually get paid for their pictures. However, a lot of youth is doing this, like as uh, Jasmina mentioned, there is like millions of youth participating in, in, in these platforms with the hope, uh, with the aspiration of sometimes uh, breaking it into the market. And, and this, uh, when we, when we think this in the global landscape, uh, as Leonel was mentioning, especially with the difference between the 
global south and the global north, we, we see like a, a lot of these influencers are coming mostly from the global north. So for, for youth who is positioned in these uh, countries uh, with uh, low levels of, uh, um, let's say, connectivity, low levels also of uh, socioeconomic uh, sta status, uh, for, for them it's even more difficult to reach this uh, position of influencers and to translate their social and cultural capital into earnings. And I, I for me, for instance, uh, uh, a, per, uh, a researcher and um, person who is positioned between the global south and the global north, it's very interesting to go back and forth, for instance, between Colombia and the United States, looking at what youth is doing in this particular context and realizing how, like, even like, for instance, youth from Colombia is trying very hard, uh, particularly for, for instance, Afro-Colombian youth from marginal places to, to break it into the music market using SoundCloud or developing videos in YouTube, they rarely reach more than 200 views, right? If you compare this with like a million views of a, of a video blogger uh, from the United States. So there are like a lot of uh, issues to consider in like who is well positioned, wh what kind of youth is positioned to actually benefit uh, at this level and at this economy of a scale uh, in a world where like the visibility of like uh, even the content that they are producing is, is, not, uh, is not equal. Um, and this brings me to my final remark and is related to the paradoxical nature of like this digital economy uh, for youth and it's like on the one hand they encounter a, sp a space where they can pers pursue their passion and develop these entrepreneurial uh, activities uh, with the hope of uh, breaking into a market, bringing innovations uh, from their different, uh, different subcultures into um, a kind of like a big audience. But however, like uh, the platforms and the algorithms and the data sometimes is not uh, available for them to really understand how they can like reach uh, the specific markets that they are willing to. Uh, so I, I, will, I will conclude with this kind of paradox of like the, the, the contradiction between like be, being able to feel free to pursue any passion, any, any interest in culture or in, uh, in, in production, uh, but it's still like uh, confronting the barriers, not only of access, but also like of like their positionality and visibility in these global and even regional networks. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, so with this, uh, Marcelino, the floor would be yours, and Alexa, next slide. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, competence. Eh? Uh, I, let me put it just in a little context of this, which is a recommendation that uh, the Commission made uh, the, the Council adopted a commission uh, proposed in 2006 and it's now being renewed in 2019, which is a recommendation for competences for citizens to live in the paradigm of uh, lifelong learning in the digital society. These competences are eight, uh, citizenship, uh, literacy, language, uh, mathematics, and also, of course, including uh, digital. And digital is uh, seen to be key. We are lagging behind in general, not only young people, citizens in Europe are lagging behind. There is a, you have mentioned that, a mismatch, a tremendous mismatch in between the market needs and uh, what people can do uh, in terms of digital. And this is what I would like to, I have a slide here. This is actually the framework, uh, which is uh, online. You can download it, have distributed a few copies, but you can download it from our web. And this is a consensus after many, 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 it's very simple, but a, consens a consensus after many, many consultations in between our services and our stakeholders in the European Union. And we came up with uh, five uh, competence areas, which are key, <coughs> information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content and creation, which is very, very much, important safety and problem solving. And in every one, there are what we call competencies and inside we have the descriptors of those competencies. You will see uh, in the next slide 
something that uh, is uh, showing also the proficiency levels, because you can be more or less proficient in terms of digital. Uh, let me say something in between brackets. A study by ICLS showed that uh, although young people now, uh, your generations, are said to be native, native, digital native, they are not necessarily competent, digital competence, because digital competence is much more than using a word or using, using an open uh, the internet and all that, that children can do very fast, even faster than me. <laughs> but uh, in, indeed, uh, digital competence is much more, as we have seen before, it's also security, it's also promoting creativity, it's also doing the most with the skills in a safe, creative manner. And uh, problem solving and trying to get information which is correct and which discard the other one which is not correct, and solving problems uh, thanks to the information society technologies we, we are living and now we, we are embedded. Uh, this is the, the eight, actually there are four big levels, let's say, the foundation, the uh, intermediary, the advanced, and the, the champions, the, the, those that are specialized. Eh? And from here to there, we call that the paradigm, of the, 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 the metaphor of uh, navigating, of swimming in the digital ocean. And we have constructed that, and it, this is being very, very much adopted by many organizations. Uh, and we have recently published a guide in the next slide. I put the, the, uh, just the title. You can also download it from our website. This is the guide to implement what I showed before, which is the conceptual framework. So there are happening many, many experiences in Europe uh, which are taking our framework and adopting and creating applications to, for instance, assess, evaluate, see how young people behave, helping people also to find a job, because we find that uh, there is a tremendous in young people, a tremendous problem. They ha are early leavers sometimes. They, are, uh, not, they have not sufficient skills. They have to be in a continuous, in a continuous uh, uh, adaptation and learning, and this is not possible very much possible if it, you have no a structured manner to do with. So there are many applications across Europe. I would cite something called Compass, uh, which is a, a beautiful project that reads, the title read your journey to digital, the upskilling platform for young unemployed people. This is one big, big platform uh, that paid out a visit the other day in Seville, and is using our framework to create applications for people, for young people to learn, to adapt to in a structured manner following the, the taxonomy of uh, competencies that I showed you before. LN for Work is another application, a nice application, which is mapping digital skills of student young workers for employment, again the same. And like this, there are several others in Europe. <coughs> so important projects. Uh, all of them are in the Digcom Interaction Guide. If you go there, this is a, an interactive, clickable PDF where you can travel by subject, nationality, uh, young, uh, uh, unemployed, and many, many others. And you will see the experiences that are happening that are uh, a big, big number, more than 50 that I have counted in Europe out of the framework. So what is important, I'd like to stress, is that uh, 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 dig dig digital competence are evolving. It needs a framework. Now that artificial intelligence is coming to stay with us, we would need also to, to see how people behave in front of uh, uh, artificial technology in uh, robots. And this is something also that has to be learned and will become also a skill and will become also a, a, a competence in general for citizens and especially for young people looking for a job. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Marcelino. So you heard at the very beginning a quick intervention about what who is contributing online, who is participating from Chismina. Andres mentioned more what kind of capitals or what are young people gaining out of this. Marcelino spoke about one framework, uh, particularly coming from a governmental entity. 
that looks at skills and uh, mentions the importance of skills. And I think with this, I give it over to Monica, who is also going to talk about skills, but more from a company side. And Alex, I think we have one more slide there. Thank you. Lori. of the work that Facebook has been doing around uh, young people who are using our platform. Um, I am indeed representing my colleague Karuna, who is based in California. Unfortunately, her visa didn't come through. We w she waited until the last minute. So as I was, um, actually my flight was about to depart, she called me and said, can you, can you fill in for me? And I said, sure. Um, but she is the expert on safety on Facebook, and I'm sure I can put you in contact with her if you'd like to, you know, deep dive in some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. Um, um, I clearly didn't dress well for these very hot rooms. <laughs> I'm wearing wool socks, so uh, pardon my... Uh, <laughs> I'm not in menopause yet. Um, Do you want me to keep doing that so you can speak? Um, I know, I know. Um, so I just like to start, I just like to um, make some comments about some of the topics that um, um, were raised in um, some of the, especially by uh, Jasmina and uh, Marcelino. Um, Jasmina, you mentioned economic gaps and um, quality and education gaps and um, also social and cultural gender, gender norms that are different. Um, and I, before I dive into the safety um, topic, which I was supposed to talk about, I, I would just like to, you know, mention that um, Facebook nowadays is a thriving platform for women. Um, uh, so many thousands of women are using Facebook to promote their business and to work from home. Um, I, of course, I wasn't planning on talking about this, so I haven't got the numbers, but I'll be happy to share numbers with you. And um, these are just amazing stories that we're seeing every day of how Facebook is enabling um, these women to just bring income to, to their homes and also stay at home and, and um, you know, depending on the, the culture and also care for their, their kids. Um, and also uh, regarding economic and quality in education, um, we are developing a series of um, hubs around the world. And I'm going to talk about the hub we um, recently um, opened in Brazil, which is called Estação Haki. Um, it's been um, going on for about a year and a half now. And we developed the program to be aimed at young um, um, unemployed uh, Brazilians who have no digital skills. So um, in a year and a half, we are close to reaching 10,000 people already trained. So these people go come to Estação Haki and they learn how to code and they learn how to program. Um, they have mentorships from professors, from um, you know startup uh, companies. A lot of them leave the course employed, um, and a lot of them have the skills to you know start their own businesses. So um, this is an amazing work, and I I know the numbers for for, for Brazil, but I know we're doing this. Um, in several countries around the world, and I'll be happy to provide more info if you know anyone would like to to know a little bit about more. Um, we we also take our um, responsibility um, around safety very seriously. We understand that if people, especially young people, are not feeling safe at Facebook, they're just not going to be on Facebook. Um, and um, Um, so we are optimistic about the use of our platforms. As you, you know, portrayed your first slide, I saw different apps from our family of apps um, in there. And we know that young people are keen, especially on using Instagram, for instance. Um, and we truly believe that we have a responsibility to provide more skills to the young people who are using our platforms. Um, and I just very quickly like to um, walk you through some of the tools that we have in place nowadays. And one of the tools is our, um, our safety, 
safety portal. So our safety, safety portal has been around for a long time, but as we learn more about how people use our platforms, we're able to develop these tools even further. And we have recently added within the safety portal a portal that's dedicated to youth, right? So it's basically, um, it provides information um, that empowers the youth, um, our youth audience to, to use our apps. Um, um, but to use our apps, um, you know, uh, with conscious, right? So we give them tips on privacy. Um, we make the language on privacy settings appealing to a young audience so they know where they, where they can go to, to change their privacy settings. Um, we are also working with tips and resources around principles, you know, like are you, are you sure you want to share everything and, and, and things like that. So, um, and then within the, the, the Porto Youth, we have developed the um, digital uh, literacy library and that's, that's where this slide stands for. And the Digital Literacy Library was developed in partnership with the Berkman Center. And I would just like to point out and thank Sandra for being such a great partner. Um, a lot of the work that's there um, was developed for, by Berkman. And um, it's basically a um, library for digital literacy, right? Um, so we, and then um, among the many issues that it touches upon, um, there are several modules um, on, um, that are aimed at a young population on privacy and reputation, on identity, on positive behavior, on safety, on community engagement. And they're very easy to use lessons that can be downloaded and be used by parents and be used by teachers, by professors in the classroom. Um, and just before I was telling Sandra, just before joining Facebook, um, I was a full-time professor of law. And um, um, I just, as I was going through these materials, I was so happy to see how, it, uh, you know, how easy they are to use and how they can be used in different environments um, by different, you know, people and really, really reach um, a large audience. So um, I know I have just, you know, very little time, but I just wanted to make sure that you know about some of the initiatives that we're taking. We're taking our responsibility towards safety and towards empowering the youth very seriously through a variety of programs. And I'm happy to deep dive into some of the issues that you might find more interesting. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much, Monica. And just to let you know that the lessons that are on the digital literacy library uh, from Facebook are available in 45 languages, so no matter more or less where you come from, uh, it should be there. And Alex, I think there's a next slide. So the lessons are all Creative Commons licensed, and the original platform where they're on is on the um, Berkman Klein's digital literacy resource platform, so you can also download them there. Currently only in English we're working on uploading all the translations, which is a lot of documents. Uh, but I think with that, the last intervention would be briefly from Juliana, and then we open up for conversation. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here so early. I told her that I have a three-year-old at home, so it's never early for me, it's always <laughs> really early in the morning. So I have a huge challenge here because I'm talking about youth in front of Brazilian youth, so <laughs> thank you so much. And I know the program really well, so it's, it's an important job we're doing here. Um, and also that I have already changed my whole presentation because I'm the last one to speak, so I would love to touch on some of the issues that my colleagues brought today. So be patient with me because I just changed the whole thing. So uh, I think that the first message I would like to leave here is that at Google we believe that internet has enhanced youth capacity to learn new things, to produce new content. I saw like a bunch of apps that I don't know because I'm not young anymore. So I think that nowadays we have, internet has provided a lot of tools for uh, youth to produce content to be creative and to be heard. 
And for that, at Google, we believe in their capacity to change the world. So we have a bunch of programs like Creators for Change that tries to enhance their capacity to produce count online counter-narratives against hate speech. And in Brazil, we have a program that I, I love a lot that's called the Safer Lab. It's a program that we, uh, we developed together with the SaferNet, which is a worldwide organization that works with online safety. And we have been working with a thousand youngsters in Brazil from 15 to 22 years old and helping them to create their own projects to tackle hate speech, both online and offline. So we have these amazing stories, like from there is this guy who is a poet from the north part of Brazil in a community that's called Quilombo, and they don't have internet on that Quilombo. So he travels by boat to have internet access, and he's been uh, going through this capacity building programs through this project called Safer Lab, and now he's, he's created a collective of poetry in his quilombo to try to bring some good messages on how people can lead, deal with bullying and stuff. So this is, uh, there are many stories around, uh, like there is this collective on the south part of Brazil that work with transgender issues. So we are helping those teenagers and young people on how they can uh, boost their capacities to be heard and to produce good content and to, to, to be creative on dealing with such challenging issues. So the second message I would like to bring here is around economic growth that my colleagues brought here. So uh, we also think that the internet and Google's tools can uh, contribute to economic growth. And we know that unfortunately not everyone has already the necessary skills to take advantage of those digital opportunities. And we are committed on changing that. So uh, we have built uh, uh, different types of initiatives that we, we connect them on the same, I would say, initiative called Grow with Google. And we have been uh, training people on digital skills, digital marketing, uh, helping them on how to become developers, entrepreneurs, and we have some uh, courses to teach kids on computer science. Um, and those, and we have a specific training for women that's called Women Wheel. So this year in Brazil, we have already organized six huge, like really big trainings in seven different cities in Brazil. And Grow with Google has trained like more than seven million people here in Europe. And I was here in Europe, but we make like I thought, where am I now? So seven million people here in Europe, and more than 13 people in Africa. And I would love to share some numbers of, of Latam uh, with you if you want. Uh, and we have this Women Wheel initiative that's training women on how to empower their capacity to have their own businesses so they can have also, we believe that financial empowerment is part of women empowerment as well, so they can have like more freedom and more options. So in Brazil this year we trained through Women Wheel 7,000 women on the whole country and we have lots of amazing stories like if you have the chance to be a part of of one of the trainings of from Women Wheel in your countries, it's like I cried in all of them because we have amazing stories of women that are learning how to to find freedom from I don't know a difficult situation through economic opportunity. So it's really important. Also, I, I would like to bring uh, uh, another program. Like we have been working in Brazil and the whole world, but I would like to bring my Brazilian perspective on media literacy programs because we believe that media literacy is a huge part on what we are going to build f uh, for the internet of the future, like for the present also, but for the future. So we are working uh, with the Ministry of Education in Brazil to build, because now we have a uh, common core, uh, how do I call it, the national curriculum basis? Curriculum, yeah. Yes, it's, we have, uh, it's similar to the common core, the K-12 in the United States, and media literacy is a pillar of this, it's, it's a, a principle of this uh, national curriculum. So we have been working with different NGOs and journalists and uh, schools to create content because it, this issue, we've been facing the misinformation issue in Brazil for a long time, but the media literacy debate, debate is so new for us because we have, uh, for that we need to develop new partnerships and to develop content that can help professors to implement media literacy strategies on their classrooms. 
uh, finally, uh, we launched this year um, in the US and in LATAM a new program called Be Internet Awesome. And the Be Internet Awesome also has lessons. And it tries to bring some uh, principles to kids uh, so they can be awesome on the internet, so that they can be responsible, uh, so they can practice digital citizenship, and, so, and also so they can be safe on the internet. So uh, it brings some principles around how to be smart and how to share with care, which is a really important concept. Uh, on how they cannot fail for fake, even if it's fake news or, I don't know, people trying to, I don't know, do bad things with them. Uh, that's uh, cool to be nice, so they need to take, they need to not only share with care, but be careful on w what people might be feeling with what they share. And it teaches how he can, they can be brave, so they can, should always ask, ask for help because they are kids. Okay, so that's it. I'll be happy to share with you on the round of questions. Thank you so much. So this was it from the five interventions. You heard again at the beginning what kind of youth are participating and what are the struggles they're facing, what are the, the gains from this participation, and then the role of literacies and the importance of developing skills and competencies, however you call it. We already are using three different terms here. Um, we planned some questions for all of you, so we had 10 questions. Uh, but I, I feel like w you might not even need the questions because you might have your own uh, remarks you want to make. But th the ten questions are the following. So where you are coming from, what are the uh, opportunities young people are encountering? Um, what kind of capital are they, they gaining from your perspective? What do you think are their motivations uh, to engage online? Uh, do you feel like we touched on this at the very beginning and Andre spoke a little bit about it? Do you think they're cultivating an economic mindset? Uh, what are some of the short term and long term gains? Why do you think young people are engaging online in these opportunities as we spoke at the beginning? Um, how can we measure all of these contributions online? How important is the role of collaboration, networks, mentorship, for instance? What do you think about the power relationship between platforms and their young users? Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, how do you think the lines between work and leisure or work and play, are they blurring? If so, in your perspective, how? Uh, and what are also the power relationships between adults and young people, and how is that affecting uh, young people in their role as uh, not just users, but consumers and producers. So these were our 10 big questions that we thought we'd throw into the room to hear your observations, but you might have other inputs to specific uh, interventionists. I don't know if that's even a, a word, but to people who spoke uh, before. Uh, any questions? Who is the brave first one? Yes, please. Uh, hello. And if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself again for the transcript. Thank you. My name is Gustavo Paiva. I'm here with Brazilian's Youth Program. And over the last two years, I've worked with SaferNet, which was mentioned already here. Um, me and a partner have in Natal, my city. That's Emily, her name. Um, we have taught about 500 children and about 400 teachers in our state about uh, online safety and we are trying to do, the, do, to do this good work. Um, we've worked with ISOC in this in a project and addressing those questions specifically, um, when I see children, the children I, I've taught, um, the, there is not a very strong dimension of econom economics for them. They, they become content producers as a form of play for children specifically, um, which, as, as has been mentioned here, they often have technical competences without having the maturity to fully use those tools. And for them, for this group of children from 12 below, they are making YouTube videos, they are trying to create an online presence, but it's more of a play thing. They don't think about the monetization of their videos and so on. It's more of a ludic thing 
and it's a way to relate to their peers in their schools, in their, in, in their communities. And again, as has been mentioned, there is often a technical competence <laughs> without the corresponding maturity, which is something we have to work a lot when we go to schools and in teachers. Teachers and parents, they don't fully comprehend this. They think that technical competence is associated with maturity. So they often let the children do as they please without fully comprehending the dangers or what can go wrong. That's what I had to say. Thank you. So do you, just an add-on question, do you think, you spoke more about younger children, do you think that changes over time uh, their mindset? You said they do it in the first instance uh, as a form of play. At what point do you think that switches? Well, specifically in Brazil, as they age and become teenagers, they often worry a lot more about academic pursuits. And some of them, I think, will drop down from this online production sphere. But I think this generation we are having now of children will evolve into a more mature perception of the economy around this. Um, the current teenagers, we, I don't see too often this economic perception still. But I think the children we have today, this generation, will mature into uh, a generation of content producers. Thank you so much. Any other thought? Oh, wow, now maybe one and then two. Uh, hi, everyone. The University of Rosario. And, and my, my intervention goes like along with Andre's intervention. And, and I would like to tell you about two examples that I as a YouTuber consumer experienced in Colombia that I think they are useful to see how young people are um, participating in, in economy. Uh, the first one is a YouTuber called Pau Tips. Uh, she's a, um, a fashion blogger and a, a, like six months ago she did uh, something really beautiful and it's that she she was born in a poor town of Colombia. It's called it, it is called Capitanejo Santander. So and now she studies at, at my university and she has lots of followers. And in every of her videos, what what she does is to uh, to prove uh, like beauty stuff, and then he she gives her opinion. So one day she decided to go back to her town with all the makeup he, he has, uh, she had gathered for, for doing the advertisement. And she stayed like in a, in a public school in, in the poor town and started to gift uh, this makeup to everyone. And she made a big a video and uploaded it to, to YouTube. So she's an example of how uh, how university students such as her are expanding this YouTube culture to like towns and zones that uh, didn't know about these contents before. I, I think she is a good example. And another successful project of, of YouTuber is that <coughs> there's currently in Colombia a new wave of YouTubers. Uh, there is Juan Pablo Jaramillo, Nicolas Arrieta, and uh, they started some movement and they now write books. So you go to libraries in Colombia and you can find books uh, written by YouTubers. So uh, I think that's pretty cool because they are mm, making young, young people be interested in things as literature. So uh, now the bad thing is that, as Andres pointed out, it, there's not only a gap between like global south and global north, but inside of Colombia there's two a, a gap, and these successful projects of YouTubers, well, they go to private universities. So uh, I think the the aim is to expand this this kind of situations to poor Colombians too, and not only for Colombians that are already uh, making these successful approachments to internet. Thank you so much. Please. My name is Harun Azim, as I told you before. I work at the uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority in Afghanistan. 
Uh, obviously, in Afghanistan, things are a lot different than uh, things are in the countries you belong. Uh, we, uh, like out of 37 million, only 4 million people are connected to the internet and uh, only very few of them, like maybe 10% of the people who are connected, they have quality service. So we are still like, because of uh, uh, like uh, insecurity and landscapes, we have like mountainous countries, mountainous country it is. So we don't even have like 2Gs everywhere where everybody else is talking about 5G and all. So it's very different, but still, like in in such, uh, there are some sex stories. But I think for uh, I'd like what I'd like uh, to have from you guys is uh, to, like we are talking about opportunities, but we want them. We want to provide the opportunities. Like in other countries, there are opportunities. How do they use it? But we have to provide the opportunities. So I'd like uh, maybe uh, if. Uh, I'd share my uh, uh, email address and everything, and if anybody has good ideas or they can connect me and uh, give their ideas on how to improve their uh, their lives. We, uh, in, the, in the regulatory uh, authority we, I work in, we also have the TDF fund, which is the, uh, 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 what do you call it? It's uh, uh, access fund, like uh, to everybody. So we have the fund, but we are still waiting for innovative ideas and uh, uh, like where we can help others to get ac accessible. And so I think uh, my, my idea would be like to gain ideas from everybody else. That's why I came here. So I think it's, uh, if anybody has, I already, we already connected to Jasmine and uh, I think I'll also get your cards and contact you for ideas for everybody from our Fantastic, and I think for sure Jasmina has a lot of examples also from UNICEF innovation, yes, yes, yes. but Andres has some experience also looking at different case studies in Colombia where internet connectivity in certain parts is not great and people also travel by boat and so forth to gain yeah. higher connectivity. I don't know if people behind me and then maybe one and then two. So sure. you first. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Steve from UNICEF. Um, so thank you very much for the presentations and the talks. It's really interesting. Um, and I like this idea of the, the paradox because often for young people it's very difficult. Uh, on the one hand, you have this platform that you can reach the world on. On the other hand, there's so much social capital and, and structure around people that if you're poor and if I'm from South Africa, that many people have ideas but they don't have, they can't access capital, they don't have the networks. I, I wanted to just zoom out for a second um, and see if anyone is thinking about data um, because the examples so far are creating economic value uh, by getting followers or by selling something or by selling content. Um, but of course data has value and this, the, whole, the whole model, economic model of the internet today is built on data. So is, you know, if we start thinking about the value that young people have just by the data that they, they give away and of course by using platforms, you give your data, but you get a platform and you get this potential. Um, but I think there would be interesting work beginning to monetize from a user perspective, think about how that data can be monetized and how the inherent value that one has. Um, yeah, and, and in a way to also teach young people not just how to be safe online, not just how to be creative, but also to be conscious of the value that they have just by being users. So if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd, I'd be interested. I don't know, Andres, if you want to say something about that, but we are definitely at Berkman Klein looking into that uh, on both sides, one on the, on the platform side and how are they making money out of young people's data, but also looking at young people themselves and are they <coughs> tracking some of the activities and are they monetizing, what are they doing with their own data? And is that even in their heads something that they can conceptualize? Scholars have pointed out about like what does it mean to be spending all this time online with this energy and work when it's not compensated, right? So these issues of free labor, for instance, or hope labor or aspirational labor that you are doing like since very early ages, but they are never receiving any form of payment. So is this youth growing up 
uh, predisposed to, when they are adults, also continue doing this free labor and crowdsourcing and all of these internet activities without even having access to their own data. So yeah, but I think like it's crucial to to also focus on like literacies around data and, and starting to understand who owns the data, who has property on it, and how it's also being analyzed, uh, leveraged, uh, created for marketing purposes. Because at the end, it's like this growth. If you look at the economy on now, it, it has grow. It has grown a lot, but uh, it's in very particular spaces, right? Like in, in places where we have like this. Uh, well, the, the companies are based. It's not well distributed, and it's in part because all this data is stored in certain places, not in, for instance, the Global South, we lack all these servers for storing data or processing it. user on Facebook between 13 and 18, you're going to get more warnings about the screen time that you're, that you're, uh, you're getting. And uh, you're going to get um, uh, messages directed at you. Are you aware of your privacy settings? And we're building language around that so that users know and they can decide at the end of the day how much data they want to share with, with the platforms. We feel it is um, extremely important to have that information more constantly sent to our young audience. Um, and also on well-being, because you, you touched upon that when you opened uh, the floor. Um, we are developing um, tools uh, both on Facebook and Instagram so that people um, are aware of how much time they're actually spending online. Um, we know that our studies shows that if uh, people are just passively consuming content, that might not be so great. But if they're acti actively um, engaging and building community, then that's, that's a good use of their time. Um, so on Instagram, for, for example, nowadays, I can keep track of how many uh, minutes or hours a day I'm using the app, and I can set uh, limits. So I set a 15-minute limit to my Instagram use. Um, and when I reach 15 minutes, then I get a warning. You know, this is, this, is, this is how much time you've spent today and this is how much you said you would. And, you know, I think that that's, I, I've been asked a lot, um, is this in the business interest? And I'm, I'm, I'm just so proud to work at a company that where we can say to our users, look, you've, you've been online for too long. Maybe you should, you know, not be here anymore. And because we're really valuing well-being as opposed to just having people in our platforms all the time and that not being good, so thank you. I think we have one question behind me, then two, and then three, and then I want to make sure Christian, my colleague, also has enough time for his remarks, but maybe you can. Yeah. So please don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay, uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Pradipta, I'm from Indonesia. So I might not be giving a question per se, but I would like to um, put on some, some input and share something back home. So uh, on the data issue that raised by the Facebook representative, I would like to say that many of Indonesian youth see that this is a pro branding issue and customer uh, acquisition cost. So if we spend more time in, in our social platform, it's not that we think that our time is, is better to spend in, in, in Instagram or in Facebook, but it's something that we have to do because it, for, for some of the social influencers, this is something very uh, beneficial for us. Okay, and that's one. And second, yes, in, in Indonesia we have so many digital economy activities and it's not only positive one, but also unfortunately some negative one. The uh, digital economy activities that happen in Indonesia is from uh, reviewing some food, traveling, and do some endorsement and so on. But unfortunately there are some service offer like cyber billing service, escorting service like in Indonesia if we uh, do some graduation in the school and it's a very disappointment from the society that you do not have a couple or, or, or another uh, another friend that can help you take food to and so on. So that's, that's another service being offered on the platform Facebook. And we have also the cyberbullying uh, service for $2, two dollars and some cents for for this, this service. And we also have the social climber phenomena where people may want to be bullied by themselves or giving some controversial statement so they can get many followers, many viewers, many likes to gain uh, enough 
public attention, so eventually they may change the direction of their content to something either economically beneficial for them or only for their own uh, satisfaction. And other thing also we have uh, follower seller. So if you pay for ten ten dollars and or twenty dollars, you can have like thousand followers. You can have thousand likes. This can be done either through uh, technical technique. Technologically, uh, perspective or these people profile that doing something controversial, they sell their own account to others. That, that thing, things happen. And for social uh, influencer, those who do, do endorsement, unfortunately, safety practices have not been really uh, implemented in, in Indonesia. So they, they sometimes share their own account in their caption. They sometimes share their personal information that should actually be protected in their own caption that can be easily be easily be extracted by anyone. They sometimes do uh, make up make up review in their own private room, so it is also exposed in Indonesia. Not to mention that Indonesia is also known with uh, distribution of illegal or well, not illegal per se, but counterfeit products. So they sometimes also happen to help the distribution and advertising of counterfeit product, which of course it is somehow <coughs> violation to the law. This this things of issue is currently happening in Indonesia and, and the government is trying to put it in the perspective and see how the policies can help this, but not really get into the grassroots level, unfortunately. That would be from my input. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Zahra Mahdi. I'm, uh, I'm the uh, advisor for uh, documentation team in Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Um, the first uh, note is about the woman empowerment. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I was interested in the note that you, you were saying that you have like um, training for the women who are starting their businesses through online. Recently in Bahrain, many women like decided to start working online through Instagram, for example, or Facebook. And you can like uh, see the difference between the proper stores uh, who has like uh, uh, CRs and they have proper people who are working online, even in the advertisement. Like you know that this one is working individually and this guy is, for example, has someone who is expert in using the, the internet. So even the design differs. So I think we need to talk like more about uh, how can we like make uh, use of this programs in Bahrain so we can help these women to, to, to be uh, better. Uh, the children in Bahrain, actually, we have uh, a rule that like uh, uh, guide the people who are uh, misusing the internet. And most of the people in Bahrain, like children, they are misusing the internet. For example, in Twitter, they are posting something because they are reacting with the hate speech. So they don't know the, the law, they don't, don't know the legal limits, again, because they are not uh, competent. They are using the internet only like without borders, without uh, very much uh, conscious. So they are sometimes being jailed, for example, for three months or even a year because they reacted with, with hate speech. So I don't know, like, um, if there is a limit in Twitter, for example, or in the Instagram, Instagram also, for the children who are using these apps, how, what, what is the limits of them? Like, how can we prevent them from being jailed, for example, for misusing this, these, uh, these apps or these uh, uh, accounts? <coughs> Thank you so much. I don't know if your intervention is very brief. Yes, no, I, the, the gentleman behind you is waiting. I'm so sorry. And then we have to go over to question because uh, otherwise my, the Swissness in me is already observing people outside, reminding me about time. So yes, please, in the back. Okay, thank you. My name is Ansgar Kuna. I'm from the University of Nottingham in the UK and also trustee of a foundation called Five Rights, which works on the rights of young people online. And I just wanted to raise the concept of age-appropriate design, which is something that's really being introduced in the UK now. It's also part of the new Data Protection Act, um, basically highlighting that, of course, youth is not really uniform. The way in which young people use the internet changes as they age. 
in many different stages. You don't go from young to adult in <coughs> one big step. And so that applies both to uh, really the way in which platforms need to interact with the user, uh, but also to the way in which the education is being done. So work we did um, at the university with young people, a lot of the feedback we got from them, for instance, was complaints that they get the same internet safety lecture every year, even though they use the internet completely differently as they age. Thank you so much. And maybe as a suggestion that the people who gave quick uh, presentations, if they can, uh, after this, wait outside. If people have specific questions for you, they can come and find you. But uh, my dearest colleague, Christian okay. Fieseler, uh, professor at the BI Business School in uh, Norway, faculty associate at Berkman Klein, has the wonderful uh, task to quickly summarize <laughs> this and see where we're going uh, from here. So Christian, yeah. the floor is yours. I will try my best. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much for coming here, especially to our colleagues from the Americas, right? Because we know and appreciate that it's very early for you. I just want to take maybe now kind of like one, two, maybe three minutes if the people outside allow us to, to maybe summarize a little bit our discussion. And I think it was a very worthwhile discussion to take a little bit of stock where we are when we are talking in terms of um, youth and the digital economy. I think we had um, somewhat in our discussion a little bit of balance between aspects of safety, of uh, safeguarding youth and children, but also looking at the uh, opportunity angle or the opportunities that are inherent in the internet and the digital economy for young people essentially growing into more independent, self-sufficient roles. Um, I think we raised a lot of interesting points, starting, for instance, from the idea of um, that sometimes we, especially as adults or older fellows, we might not always be in the best position to always understand what young people are doing and sometimes this might also lead to a kind of over um, emphasis on essentially curbing emerging practices, right? This idea of not understanding what youth are doing and then maybe being to be overprotective. I think we also had an interesting perspective or an interesting discussion in terms of um, or what skills are we talking about, right? Are we talking about traditional skills? Are we talking about safety practices? Or are we then talking about the maybe right now less emphasized skills, the creative skills, and that would maybe also forward the idea of strategic skills and building even on top of creative skills, right? The idea not of even being creative, being a creator, but also using that creativity in means and ways that might uh, give um, some additional impact or that might um, skill you for endeavors later on in life. We had um, an interesting discussion or interesting inputs about global perspectives or also in terms of how we need to understand skills, right? We talked about the matter of access and connection, but also the idea of socioeconomic backgrounds um, going to uh, matters of gender imbalances and socioeconomic and cultural capital. I would maybe just um, propose two points, right, in terms of, um, I, I think we had uh, two interesting um, discussion points maybe also for going forward. The one is the idea of policy matters, right, that maybe going forward we need to understand better what kind of gains youth are actually getting from participation. Do we actually already measure all the participation that uh, youth are bringing to the digital economy and which efforts are more visible than the others, right? Are we sometimes maybe overemphasizing efforts which are more flashy, like media production, and do we also capture well enough right now um, things which might create also longer term value, like uh, coding or um, knowledge creation? And finally, we also then raised maybe some forward-looking question. I think it was already a little bit inherent here in this discussion here um, to what kind of like economy are we skilling youth? Are we skilling them to the economy which we have right now? Or do we need to connect that with, for instance, matters of artificial intelligence and an economy that some observers might argue might look very different in 10, 20, 30 years when uh, maybe the traditional intelligence which we're using right now in terms of our just office work or so might uh, be complemented by artificial intelligence and what do we do then? And I think, Sandra, you are going to have an interesting session uh, for that yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, so there's one more slide and then we're leaving very quickly.
Thank you for being so patient. So thank you for everyone for coming to this session. We have a few more connected sessions to, to this one, so maybe take a picture and then let's try to uh, make the room available for the people after us since we're already late. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>